Great. So I'm going to talk about why diversity matters, because that's the right thing we want to start with first, um, to get us all on the same page. And I think that um, here we go. Uh, probably everyone in this room has heard at least a little bit about why diversity matters. You've heard maybe some claims, so some of the research, the numbers. So we'll talk about that. Um, I'll run through a couple studies that I thought were worthy of highlighting so that we all have kind of a shared understanding of what the impact of diversity can be. But I also want to go through the how. So how diversity matters. What is supposed to happen when you get diversity in the door? What is the magic um, that, that the research says happens? And especially, I want to go through that because um, you might be seeing the research and hearing what the claim is. But what if your experience tells you otherwise? What if it doesn't match what you think other organizations are enjoying? And then I'll kind of I'll wrap up with a little bit of what do you do now? All of that, given all that, what am I supposed to do with this information? So here's the claim, right? Diversity leads to greater profit and innovation. In fact, workplace, workplace diversity is among the most important predictors of a business sales revenue, customer numbers, and profitability. That's a finding from a study out of the University of Illinois in Chicago, authored by Senator Deering. And I'm going to, I'll go through four, four or five different major findings that this study um, published. So first of all, the most racially diverse companies that they, that they reviewed were, they had 15 times more sales revenue than the least racially diverse companies. Gender diversity accounted for almost $600 million in average sales revenue. And this is some encouraging, this is an encouraging finding because we're seeing incremental impact. So even if you, if, even if you make small efforts, you should see small impact. And the more effort you make, the more impact you should see. So they found that every percentage increase in racial and gender diversity equated to 9% and 3% increase in sales revenue. Customer numbers also increased. So again, small increases in racial and gender in, in racial and gender diversity resulted in 400 more customers and 200 more customers. So that was one study. Here's another one out of McKin McKinsey, and they found that gender diverse organizations were more like were 15 percent more likely to outperform, and racially for ethnically diverse organizations were 35 percent more likely to outperform than the least diverse organization. And that they also found a linear relationship. So this is encouraging because again, there's no tipping point, there's no bar that you have to meet in order to start seeing results. They also found um, for every 10 percent increase in racial and ethnic diversity at the senior level. Sales increase, earnings increase before interest in tax, about 0.8%. And I want to make another point here because we're measuring, uh, most of the research is focused on race and ethnicity and gender because they're really easy to measure, right? People are used to being asked those questions. Age, too, is easy to measure. Um, but I would, if I were you, I would assume, and I'm not an academic, but I, for practical purposes, I would assume that so many other dimensions of diversity also have a similar impact. So sexual orientation, we don't typically ask that, although that's in the news and it might come up later. <laughs> uh, personality is harder to measure, right? There's a way that it costs money. Personal experiences, diversity of personal experiences, what people bring behind them, where do they come from in their last jobs, where do they used to live? All those, di all those different dimensions of diversity if I were you, practically speaking, I would assume that they also matter. They can also make a difference. All right, so what happens if you've heard this before, you know you're supposed to be seeing an impact from diversity in the door, in your workplace, but your experience just doesn't match that. And you, you start to see a different picture of it. Maybe you have been successful in getting diversity in the door, in recruiting diversity, but then, what happens? Do you see communication breakdown? Do you see interpersonal issues crop up? Do you see group dynamics start to go south a little bit? Communication suffering? Maybe you've seen legal issues, discrimination claims. And that costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of time, and it certainly lowers morale. So if this at least in part 
represents some of your concerns. This is what perhaps you're worried about. Um, you're not, it's not necessarily an illusion. Diversity can be a source of mistrust, right? If you are interacting with somebody who seems different from you, maybe you have, you feel like you just have to, you know, chip away a little bit before you start to trust them. Diversity can be a, a source of discomfort. Again, if you're not comfortable with someone because they look different, they act different, they talk different, um, they seem different, you may not be comfortable with them right away. So this is not an illusion. This, you know, this is human stuff. Oops. It can be a source of resentment. Frankly, you know, diversity can be a source of conflict. So it's important to acknowledge that. Which is why I want to go into a little bit of how. So if diversity is supposed to be so magical and have this big impact, what exactly is supposed to happen? Well, so let's get a little bit into the psychology behind it. Um, diversity is a catalyst for creativity and deep thinking. What diversity does, um, it spurs deeper information processing. It spurs complex thinking. Um, we make higher quality decisions. And that happens because when you're in a diverse group, Everybody has access to now a greater variety of perspectives. If you're sitting there among a diverse team, you are now listening to different people's opinions or different opinions that may, maybe brush up against what you thought. Or maybe they, it conflicts with what you would have heard otherwise. Maybe you don't agree with them. So that's what's going on and what causes information, the deeper information processing. Um, I'm going to throw a few interesting studies out here that I thought was worth, were worth mentioning. There was a study in 2006 there where the researchers created these uh, mock juries. They put the participants on these on these juries and they and said, "Okay, now you're you're a juror." I think it was a team of four, and they had different juries where it was diverse, and I believe it was uh, racially diverse: two white and two black jurors, and then they had homogenous jury, all black and all white. And they told them to deliberate these facts and discuss. And what they found was on the diverse juries, the white jurors considered more case facts. They considered those facts more carefully. They deliberated more. They made fewer errors compared to the homogenous, or compared to the to the white jurors on, the, on their homogenous juries. What makes this so hard for all of us, or many of us, to really um, truly and internally with all of ourselves really get on the bandwagon and believe all of this is because homogenous teams just feel easier. They feel more effective. And it makes a lot of sense. Has anyone heard of the fluency heuristic? The, flu <laughs> the fluency heuristic says that we like to, or we prefer to process information that is familiar and easy. And it just makes a lot of sense. I mean, how much information is flying by our eyes and our faces every minute? Thousands of pieces, bits of information. And our brains just don't want to have to work that hard. We have to select what we choose. We have to choose what we want to process. And we choose the information that is easier and familiar to us. So it's human. It makes a lot of sense. In fact, the people, the, um, we feel less effective when we're on, when we're on, we're in, in a diverse group. When we're on a diverse team, we just judge our own effectiveness as less. So the research tells us that that's not necessarily true, right? Like diverse teams are supposed to be more effective. But the perception matters. That perception is there. Another study I want to show you about, or tell you about, um, in 2009, they gave participants a video to watch and a transcript to read. And they're watching these teams, again, diverse teams and homogenous teams. And they're watching these teams um, discuss. I don't know what the topic was, but they were discussing something, something um, related to business, need, business needs. And the participants had to watch these videos and read the transcripts and then judge, evaluate how much conflict these teams had amongst themselves and allocate resources depending on how much they felt their needs were, were worth the resources. So study participants who were watching 
a diverse group, a diverse team, evaluated them as having more conflict than the participants who are evaluating a homogenous team. What they didn't know that you can probably guess is that the two teams were verbatim exactly the same. The transcripts were exactly the same. They were discussing the exact same thing. So what's left is our perceptions are telling us we're perceiving these diverse teams as having more conflict. And and then I should have said also what they uh, the, the, the study participants were allocating fewer resources to those diverse teams. So here's an example of how our perceptions and our bi our biases actually have a, a very real in, uh, economic impact. We overly trust people who are like us, who we perceive as like us. We think that they're kind of the same, and that's a whole different conversation. You know, assuming somebody is just like us because they look the same and they talk the same. Um, another story, interesting story out of a study, um, this was at uh, the University of Texas. They, uh, they gave their, students, their study participants the job of guessing at the values of these simulated stocks. So they did, um, how, how much do you think these stocks are valued? At? And they took their individual answers, and, and then these participants were supposed to buy and sell within a group. They were supposed to be trading these stocks. And uh, again, we're looking at a diverse group of people buying and selling, and then a homogenous team of people buying and selling. Here's what they found. The, the traders, the participants who were interacting with the diverse group, were fish, their answers to uh, uh, the stock prices were 58% more accurate. So they're much more likely to get close to the true value of those stocks, those simulated stocks. And as they interacted with the people around them, with those diverse, in their diverse group, their performance increased. And they were using real money. They had a real stake in the game, so they actually wanted to get their answers right. And what I think is particularly interesting is that over here on the, the homogenous team, the people who were buying and selling with people who they perceive as this kind of, kind of the same as them, um, those people, and this gets back to overly trusting, those people copied and imitated people around them in the wrong direction. They were placing undue trust in the answers and the perceptions of the people around them because they figured they were right. They figured, you're like me, I trust you, which gets back to the fact of the mistrust. And it makes me think, when we walked in this office this afternoon, um, the door was locked. And there was, a, there was a man who let us in, and he, and he said, well, you guys look trust trustworthy. And I thought, Nice, nicely dressed, you know, middle class women who don't look threatening, overly trusting. We didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> we didn't break it. We didn't. We didn't break anything. But we trust people because they seem like us. And sometimes, um, or oftentimes, at least in a business case, that doesn't spur that information processing, that deep thinking, the complex thinking, that will release some of that creativity and the impact that we talked about in the end. The cognitive friction, that mistrust, it feels less effective, it feels hard, but it is good for business, good for interaction. So conflict is normal, right? But the key, of course, is how you manage it. If companies want their young, diverse talent to become the next generation of leaders, they need to create a culture that truly embraces diverse opinions, perspectives, and lifestyles. Done. <laughs> No, way easier said than done. So we're making way more effort now than we ever have to create, a, to build a pipeline of diversity. Many, many more organizations are doing it and they're cognizant of that. Um, so great, that's good news. We're getting more diversity in the door, but what we're not seeing yet is that diversity is not yet getting promoted to leadership. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we don't know how to focus on inclusion. At least most of us don't yet. And without focusing on inclusion, your diverse talent is going to walk out the door. They, they may not feel respected. They may not feel like they belong. They may not feel like they're being heard. Um, and again, the key here is that you, your diverse talent has to feel like they can express their unique perspective. That's ultimately what you care about. Perspective taking is, a real, is key here. And what I mean by perspective taking is essentially, and very simply, 
putting yourselves in somebody else's shoes, imagining somebody else's point of view, which seems very simple, uh, but it is powerful because when you take somebody else's or you imagine somebody else's point of view, it can smooth out international or inter interpersonal interaction. It can reduce bias. When you ask your team members to consider each other's perspectives, that can be a really powerful thing and start to unleash that potential that your diversity has. So again, people have to feel respected and welcome before they feel free to express their opinions. The key here is not to take a kumbaya approach. Um, if your organization's <laughs> culture embraces difference as opposed to ignoring difference, then you're allowing people to really express their opinion and feel free to be themselves and again, unlock that, that potential. If your mentality is, ah, and then, you know, the Minnesotans in this room will understand where I'm coming from. If your mentality is, I love everyone, I don't care if you are blue, green, pink, or gray, I love you all the same. You're all the same word in my heart. That's not helping. Um, you have to get to the point where you can genuinely say, you know what, I like what some of these blue people bring to the table. I like what some of those pink people are saying. I like what the green people have to offer sometimes. That's more genuine, and that way you are embracing diversity, and you're embracing difference. You're welcoming difference, and you're encouraging it to, to, to come out. Um, and that's a really key stepping stone, maybe one of the first stepping stones to creating an inclusive environment. I think with that, we can open it up for discussion. So if people have questions or experiences that they want to share, I welcome that. All right, so Anna, um, how do we prioritize uh, diversity recruitment and um, how do some of the people in the room, I guess actually asking everybody, how do you prioritize diversity recruitment and um, do you have a problem that even though you're trying to prioritize it, it's just not happening? You're not even finding those diverse candidates in the first place to interview. Um, so I'll repeat the question, especially for the folks online. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and tell me if I'm getting straight or not. Right. Especially for uh, you know talent acquisition and HR, who obviously, uh, not obviously, but many people say they want to, they, they care about diversity recruitment. They want diverse talent, but somehow it never makes it to that priority list. Mm -hmm. Or it's always on the priority list, but it never gets perhaps the right support or the right investment. I'm curious to hear anybody's experience in this room. I'm on a call today, and they were talking about making sure you get the word out in the right places. Because as a white female, you go, oh, I would do this, so I would do this. But that's not what everybody's doing. So we have to think about what audience you're trying to draw in and then think about how they would get that information. Right. You have to think about where your audience is, right? And one point I guess I want to make is I think that some, I think a lot of HR professionals or people in general are afraid to target. And I hope that you should give yourself permission to target because if you want, different people in the door. If you want people who bring in different perspectives, you have to do something different. And targeting is not bad. You, um, you have to find, you have to do your research to find where those people are. If you're looking for women engineers, if you're looking for um, Spanish speakers, if you're looking, you know, you name it, and what you're doing is not working, you have to give yourself <coughs> permission to target and do something different to find different people. And, and to get back to the question of how to prioritize, every, everything you should always, honestly, you should always start with data. If you don't have data that tells you our, our diversity talent, how long do they stick around? Do we feel like we're losing? We have a nutrition problem? Do you feel like it? Do you know it? What is your data? What data t tell you that, that, um, any, that your diverse hires are any different than the workplace as a whole? 
Because if you do a little bit of research and you do say, you know, um, well, exit interviews, but also stay interviews, right? So people who are employed still and you think they're still happy, look into, collect some data, find out what are their pain points before they head out the door. Collect data and then you start to um, draw a picture of what your problem is, if you have a problem. And only then can you start to build, you know, say a diversity retention program. Other people's experience about diversity recruitment or prior side? Anybody else want to share? Anna, just to piggyback on what you're saying, um, I don't think you could take a one-size-fits-all approach to different diverse communities. We say diversity, 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 and then you lumped in women and uh, African Americans and Latinos and uh, people who are LGBT, and each group actually needs a different strategy to bring them in the door. Each group, and also, and this is this is why it's so hard to wrap our heads around this, is because each individual has different experiences. And if what you're seeing is, let's say, a nutrition problem, and you're losing a diverse talent, you cannot put everyone in the same bucket. Um, and you can't even put people who, you, you know, you're really tempted to put that same, you know, that same drop-down selection <laughs> into the same bucket. You have, to do, you have to do more research into why this person is not feeling engaged. Why is this person leaving? Why is that person um, not speaking up in meetings. So your managers are really, really, really essential in engaging their, their staff and getting to know where their pain points are. Because ultimately, again, what you really want to get the point you want to get to is where everybody, including your diverse talent, feels free to speak their perspective. Because that's where you get that the the people are, are forced to consider different perspectives. One of the things I hear uh, people talk about you know, when it comes to the inability to retain diverse talent is you kind of need a critical mass. You need you know enough so that folks don't feel like they're singled out, they're the token, whatever. Um, and I mean, in some communities are less diverse, and it is a little more difficult to you know have that critical mass of folks. Uh, I mean, how how would you recommend dealing with that sort of situation? I mean, you could try to hire a whole lot of people and you know do it all at once, but that's got its own challenges. How, how do you address that? You know, need to make those people feel welcome when maybe they are you know smaller percentage. So I have thought, but I would I'm encouraged if anyone else have a reaction to that. Nobody likes to feel like a token. But you're right, it can be um, intimidating. I would fo focus on other dimensions of diversity that are harder to measure. Because then when you get something, when you wrap your wrap your mind and you and you get on board with some sort of diversity, and we're talking about personality, we're talking about experiences, age, um, what else? <laughs> Ability, I mean body shape, you know? So, Wrap your mind around something so you're not just focusing on skin color, for example. And then once you start to identify those dimensions of diversity, then you can start to build that culture of inclusion, which is a huge initiative, right? It's not just, oh, I'm just going to, we're going to build a culture of inclusion. But if you have something that you can work with, then you should be able, you, you should be able to move forward and, and take those dimensions of diversity into account and build your culture around that so that when you have your tokens, right, people who feel like tokens, walk in the door and it's a more obvious dimension of diversity, like skin color, you've already built this foundation of inclusion. And in theory, your your people will be more welcoming and you won't lose your talents. And, and I think you Building on that, and, you know, we're really talking about engaging, you know, engaging the employee base, and we're talking about the recruiting piece of it. Um, I, I think it's really important to, you know, it's not when that candidate is applying to a specific role. It's like starting to have these pipelines and engaging with potential candidates before you have a role 
you know, personalizing that process, that message to them, as you're talking about whether whatever you know group they're in, um, you know, I think that's really key. And so if you can start to like have you know, uh, you know, whether it's through technology or just one on one, you know, reaching out, but having that that pipeline of diverse talents and you know, marketing emails or, or whatnot, like that that helps um, a, a ton. So by the time a role opens up, that they're a good fit for, they've gotten to know you already yeah. in your organization. So I think that's another way to really you know, help to increase the diverse hires. You know, on engagement, I think that's what I think you'll bring that up because all of our, all of your employees want to feel valued. All of your employees want to feel like they're heard and they're contributing. <coughs> so that's not unique to diverse hires. Everybody wants to feel valued. So engaging every individual is to find out what are their strengths, what do they need to build, and what are the gaps. And this is an important point where if you, let's just say in your workplace you have a dominant culture of white male. Um, and a white male dominant culture may, or, um, has, is afforded the, some advantages where you walk in the door and people may trust you a little bit more instantly, right? Or you have a well, you have a good network around you just because um, of that, you know, the, the, the culture of trust around you. But recognize that if somebody does not fit that dominant culture, there's a gap there. And so their manager, again, is really key in helping them. So what is, what's missing to help to engage you the most? Do you, need to, do you need a mentor to feel more networked, to feel more supported? Um, do you not feel like people trust you? Let's come up with a plan. Let me talk to every, you know, find out what those gaps are so that they can feel as engaged as people from that dominant culture. And I think with that, I mean, <laughs> any other, I mean, are any other comments that people want to make in the last couple minutes? Don't forget your allies. You know, I think um, even if you don't belong to a particular demographic, if you genuinely care and can just convey that you genuinely care, that goes a long way with any group. Thank you. Awesome.